Library Committee. And they give a review of a book. I don't know what, it, what old is, but old is older than me. And it's a great reminder that God has given us life on this earth until he takes us away. And so there's one of the encouragement that basically says, don't sit there and let your life go away. My grandfather retired and he sat on the front porch in a rocking chair and rocked away about 10, 12 years. And I decided that I would not do that. And I hope that you will be the same because we have a lot to do for Jesus Christ with whatever energy we have. Amen? Amen. Let's have a closing word of prayer. It doesn't get any better than that, I tell you that right now. And then I heard another amen. We invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. The passage goes from verses 5 to 24 and beyond, and this is a two-part service, and next Sunday will be the best part, presented by a piano. Then after that, we get back on to Luke 21, beginning with verse 5. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, see to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all of these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. And it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony so make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now that sounds like an upbeat reading, does it not? It just, make, just makes you want to get up and start dancing in the aisles. <laughs> if only. <laughs> At any rate, what we were going to say was, there is a statement of history. What we see here is that there is an interest in history. And what we want to do is kind of explore that idea. For the disciples, along with ourselves, needed to learn that not only is it important to know the course of history, but our response to it is just as important. They had an idea of what was going to happen. They had an idea of the course of history. And what we see is Jesus Christ turned the whole thing upside down. There they were. Things were looking good. While some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. This is the second or the third temple, depending on how you count. 
It was the temple that Herod the Great built. Started in 20 BC, roughly, and was still under construction at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD by Titus Vespasian. It was beautiful. The central court was lavish in plaques and with all kinds of figures, sculptures. Herod the Great had nearly a six-foot grapevine out of pure gold hanging on the wall. There was a lot of luxury. There was a lot of a tremendous amount of rich material. And the disciples were having a good time. Things were on a roll. They had the great entrance into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry of our Lord. Our Lord had purged the temple of the money changers. There was a great following. They could see it, they could taste it, they could feel it. The promised kingdom was at, was at hand. Just almost reach out and touch it. And all of that would center around Jerusalem and it would center around the temple. And as they were looking at the beauty of the temple, worthy to receive the king that was longed for for so many centuries, the one who they proclaimed as king dashed their hopes. Notice they made a request. The request followed the triumphant entry. The request followed the purging of the temple. The request is in response to the Lord's surprising prediction and the prediction begins with the destruction of the temple. The temple will not be a part, not this temple, will not be a part of the ushering in of the kingdom. This temple will be thoroughly, totally, and utterly destroyed. Not one stone will remain on top of another. And what we noticed that what was said at around 30 to 33 AD was thoroughly accomplished in 70 AD. Far enough away that Jesus Christ couldn't look at the circumstances and come up with a logical guess close enough to validate his ministry as prophet, far enough away to validate his ministry as prophet. How many believers were still alive at the time of the destruction of the temple remains to be seen, but we know that the apostle John was still alive and he lived to see that fulfillment. But Jesus has the authenticity of the prophet. Remember what the standards were. The standard set down by the law of Moses was if a man would come to you as a prophet and would make a prediction and that prediction would fail, that prophet would be stoned. If a prophet would come and would call the people away from the law, the book of Moses, that prophet would be stoned. If you're going to be a prophet in Israel, you better be right 100% of the time. If you're going to be a prophet in Israel, not only had you better be right 100% of the time, but you better know the good book. And Jesus knew both of those quite well. He knew the implications and it was no problem to him. And so we want to take a look at the request. They questioned him saying, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Notice what is taking place in their thinking. When and what? Since we had our calendar in place, since we had our timetable in place, since we had our schedule in place, and now you have nullified them, when will these things happen? And what will be the introductory sign? Lord, give us a heads up. We thought we had a heads up, and now we don't. So let us know when this is going to happen. But just when is not enough. We need to know what the sign will be so that we can put the two together and say, this is it, the time is now. And this was the question, what will be the introductory sign? Let us know, we need to fill it in. 
What is the sign that introduces these events? Notice the same question as recorded by Matthew. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Something new is added. What and when? As recorded by Matthew, when will these things happen? We've already heard that. What will be the sign of your coming? But notice, even the end of the age. What will be the sign of your coming that brings in the close of this age and the beginning of the golden era? Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? When? What? What will bring the consummation of the age into existence? And notice here. And all of these prophecies will be fulfilled. This is what is at issue with them. Not much different than today, right? You can find some preachers on TV, they've got charts galore. And they've got charts that will tell you about this, that, and the other thing. They'll even tell you when the last canary will land. But there's going to be something that is important to Jesus Christ. He does not condemn them in any way for wanting to know the what of the situation and the when of the situation. But he's going to speak of a how. He's going to speak of how you should be responding to these things. And indeed, we need to know the facts of what and when, but we need to place ourselves in history. We need to place ourselves so that we can carry on our lives as the Lord wants us to do. The what, the when, Jesus is going to add that element. And I would submit to you that that element is the important thing. What is your response? Just running around saying Jesus is going to come soon may not be enough. Notice the Lord's reply. The reply is going to touch on the world affairs. It's going to touch on God's people. It's going to touch on Israel and Jerusalem. Concerning the world fairs. And he said, see to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. What we see is that religion prospers. Maybe not the right one, but religion prospers. Religious movements will abound. See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And notice that the he is in italics, which tells us it's not in the Greek script. And what they're saying is, I am. Just as Jesus would say in his ministry before Abraham was, I am. And he claimed to be the Jehovah of the burning bush. Notice that the false prophet comes and he says the same thing. And just because he says it, and this is the important thing that we will see, and I want my people, as much as I can as pastor, I want you to know that the false prophets can perform miracles, and to have somebody run after someone because they perform a miracle is insufficient. And I will stand firm on that ground. False prophets can do great things. Many antichrists will appear. And notice many will be deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will mislead many. Notice that it would seem that in that background, there is a large company of people who have an understanding of the coming of Messiah. They have an understanding of the coming and they seem to have some desire of the coming, but they don't have discernment. 
They don't have the discernment that ultimately comes from a new birth. And we as the people of God should be discerning that just because somebody says, I am, doesn't make it so. And just because they can do the miraculous, it by itself does not make it so. Remember Deuteronomy. The miracle must take place, but the prophet must also conform his message to the word. For false prophets, for false Christs and false prophets will come, and they will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, notice, if possible, the elect. They're going to come, and they're going to show signs and wonders, and they're going to do it for the express purpose of leading people astray. They are good counterfeits. Sometimes you hear people say, well, Christianity can't be true because you've got the hypocrites and all of that. This is hypocrite par excellence, but this I suggest to you. The value of a counterfeit dollar bill is predicated upon the existence of a real dollar bill. The value of a counterfeit Christ is predicated upon the value of the real Christ. And this is what we need to keep in mind. And they are so good that if it were possible, the very elect themselves would be deceived. But in the midst of all of this religious turmoil, notice that the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. It's in our lifetime. I find it is interesting that in our lifetime, two things have come into existence that hasn't been into existence over all these centuries. First of all, the capability to eliminate all of civilization, all of humanity, has taken place in our lifetime. And second of all, in our lifetime we have seen a tremendous expansion of the gospel going around the world. That was not exactly true in our grandparents' era. In our grandparents' era, the missionaries were going, the evangelists were going, the work was moving forward, and now we are seeing the prosperity of that in terms of the faith. And so the gospel itself must be proclaimed to all the nations, but notice that while the religious aspect seems to be flourishing, the gospel above all else, civilizations will be threatened. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. He then continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Notice that civilizations will be threatened. Civilizations will be undermined. There will be wars. Notice that the term disturbance can mean insurrections within countries. There will be the attempt to overthrow the government. And certainly in some cases it will take true. It will be true. And notice that nations will be at odds with other nations. Kingdoms against kingdoms. World affairs, in the end, we look at turmoil. And notice that the natural disasters are also there. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. And while we find people today running around trying to save the earth and worrying about temperatures, they're on the right track but for the wrong reasons. What we see is that there's a total disintegration. And this is what we have to look forward to. And that's why in Luke 21, 9 and 10, when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. Listen, my friends, sometimes when I hear us talk as Christians, we act as though we're going to be 
the sheep for the slaughter. Oh my, what are we to do? We find there is persecution. We find, yes, that there is execution. But notice we are not to be terrified. We're supposed to be bold. We're supposed to be strong. For the sake of the Lord and the gospel, let's be bold and strong. And human existence itself will be threatened. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. If you are here and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a part of that chosen company. And look what an honored position that is. If it weren't for the sake of the elect, God would allow the whole thing to disintegrate. You are here for a purpose. You are here for a grand purpose. And because of your presence, the unbelieving world who likes to scoff at true faith in Christ, they're being saved from total destruction because you're here. And there's no reason for apologizing for being a Christian. If there's anything, they ought to be thanking us that God has left us to be here because my take on the Bible is heaven is a far better place than this. So there must be some real value for our presence here. And that's why as seniors read that book in the library and promise that we won't sit on the porch rocking our lives away. As long as we have breath, let's do it. Because these people are really honored by our presence, whether they know it or not. This is a two-part message. I didn't get through the whole thing today, but I have one person who will tell me if I go a minute over, and I wouldn't want to single that person out in any way. But it does get a little long, so we'll close it off here. But what I would like to do is at least remember some of the things that Jesus Christ says in this passage. What will be the signs? And he said, the time is near. Do not go after them. Let's be sure that we are not misled. This is why we put the emphasis upon God's word here. The only way that we're not going to be misled is to know the word. We don't know the word just so we can make it through ourselves. We know the word so that we can be everything that God wants us to be. So let's be sure that we are informed enough not to be misled. When you hear of the wars and the disturbances, do not be terrified. Be brave, be bold. Remember that it's by your endurance that you will gain life. And know, be on the alert. At all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Let's live our lives in the most difficult of times in such a way that we can stand before Jesus Christ, having every encouragement that we will hear from him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what this is all about. If heaven is such a great place, why aren't we there? Because we are on a mission. And let's be sure that that mission will not be undermined because of our sluggish ways. Let us be on the alert. Let us be men and women of prayer. And let us do our part for the sake of the gospel. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the fact that, you're saved, that your Son, our Savior, would lay it out with such clarity, with such honesty. It's not softened. It's not watered down. It is what it's going to be. And we are told who it is that we should be. Grant to us the faith to do and to be everything that you want from us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.